The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 28th chapter. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw Him, they worshipped Him, but some doubted. Jesus came and said to them, All authority and in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always to the close of the age. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give You thanks for You have blessed us with the gift of Your Word. And in that Word, we have come to know You. By the power of Your Holy Spirit, that Word has brought faith within us. And thousands of years after the commission was given, we gather. We thank You for the saints who have gone before us, for the faith they shared. And we pray that that faith would grow within us, that we would be witnesses in this day and age. We pray that You would bless us, turn our hearts and minds to You and Your will, and give us strength by Your Spirit to do it. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if I have done your premarital, you're familiar with this. Uh, Premarital classes, we get together to talk about marriage and love and, and what makes for successful marriages. Um, to be really honest, my wife has been very patient with me, uh, and any wife of mine would need to be, of course. Um, uh, but uh, I haven't always had as much time, um, and uh, we haven't always had as many resources, uh, but yet she's with me. And one of the things I think that has helped us is a practice that I suggest to other couples, and that is that once a month, You get out of the house, go somewhere else. You get a chance in a a hotel or somewhere else uh, to kind of look at your marriage from a distance. You get to kind of reflect on it. You also get to look forward to that coming. So every month you're getting away. Even though it gets hectic and you don't get as much time, that's coming. We actually have a list up in our bathroom wall uh, where I cross it out. Either I do or she does every day. And how many days until? Well, we have our 49th anniversary coming up this next week. And we have counted down. So uh, with three days to go, uh, we're going to go to Savannah. You could go anywhere. It doesn't matter. It's not a fancy hotel that you need, but just some time. Now, you may be thinking, really, 12 times? What would you reflect on 12 times getting out of the house and doing that? Well, what we do and what I suggest to people is to have particular events you want to remember. It took a little while, but we searched back in our records and contacted the junior college that we both went to where we met and found the day of our first date. And our first date, it won't surprise you was actually a cruise because we like cruising and it's kind of part of our life that's the way it began our very first date well it wasn't really that kind of a cruise it was a circle line cruise around Manhattan now that may not be all that romantic but I to this day remember kissing Chris under the Brooklyn Bridge with a, the ship went underneath it and uh, and it was just all lit up at night and And so when we go away in May, uh, we we kind of remember that and and reflect on it. What we do as a church, marking this day as Holy Trinity, is part of a pericope series. It's a listing of lessons as a tool, as a means for reminding us of the important aspects of the faith. I mean... Any group of Christians, you don't have to find some theologian to do this, you would do it. I mean, if, if we didn't have it, you'd be saying, you know, how about if we, what things do we need to remember that Jesus did? Uh, well, he, he was born, so we ought to remember Christmas. 
we ought to prepare for that. So we're going to have the season of Advent preparing us for the coming of Jesus. We have to remember His crucifixion and His resurrection and the Holy Week before that and then the preparation of, the, of joining in His sacrifice in the season of Lent. And that's how the church year developed. There are denominations that do not use the church year at all. They, they don't. Some of your friends you may know may not even celebrate Christmas. Um, but we do. And one of the things that kind of works against us is a Sunday like Holy Trinity. And the reason it works against us when we're trying to encourage others is that they will point out to us that's not in Scripture. And they are correct. The word Trinity is not in the Bible. But the doctrine of the Trinity, that God, the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God, is clearly proclaimed in Scripture. And we call that Trinity Sunday. If I were having a conversation with a pastor you know who doesn't use it, uh, I would be renaming perhaps this Sunday from Holy Trinity Sunday to the Great Commission Sunday. That's really what's going on. It is a command of Jesus, kind of his last will and testament. You know that legally your last, last words carry weight in the legal system. If, if you're dying and you say something, uh, you know, well, you'd need a witness. You'd need, uh, uh, you know, how do you avoid it being hearsay? It is the last words. What we've got in the gospel lesson are the last words of Jesus. They ought to carry significance for us. And although they do apply to pastors, to missionaries, to evangelists, to denominations, to churches, it must also apply to each of us. The Great Commission sounds so magnanimous, so huge, that, that it's not something we would do. It, it's what churches do. It's what denominations do. No. Disciples make disciples. So I'd like to reflect on this last word of Christ. Um, and just as a reminder, this is out of order. We, we did uh, Easter three Sundays, Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, and then finally moved on. It was a week later. Thomas is with the disciples. Well, this particular Sunday is actually happening before Pentecost. So if you keep that in mind, we're going to look at that a little bit. So, it begins, Jesus' words, Go therefore. Now that's pointing to something else. And, and what it's pointing to is His authority. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. I grew up in New York. And, and uh, up in Albany, we would get 110 inches of snow a winter on average. And one of the things you looked forward to uh, was a snow day. And every once in a while, you'd have a friend who'd call and say, Hey, snow, uh, it's a snow day. We don't go to school today. Now, sometimes they were screwing around with you. They, they were just, you know, the school would be on, but they'd say it's off, and you look at all the snow. Well, of course, and you go playing, and then you get marked absent, and you're in trouble. So when somebody says, school's closed, a New York kid would say the same thing. Around, around New York, the whole thing would be the same. Anybody know what it is? Anybody New Yorker? Flash your lights if you know it, I'll, I'll believe you. The response of a kid to hearing it's a snow day is, says who? That's the phrase. I got to know by whose authority. Was that a teacher who called you? Was it on the news? Your parents told you? I need to know whose authority by which you say this. And the great commission that is given is the authority given to Jesus. All authority in heaven and on earth. Nothing superior to His authority. So when he gives the command, it's not like a suggestion, yeah, you might try this. This is the king who is setting up the kingdom and setting out the future. So, go therefore and do what? Make disciples. Well, we have to ask the question whether or not personally you've done that. 
Now, I, I'm not trying to make anybody feel guilty. I, I want you to reflect on whether that's your assignment. Now, I know other denominations kind of get better at this than we do, but I'm going to try to encourage you. I want you to think for a minute about people you know who are not involved in church, who in any conversation would never bring up Christ, maybe uh, make a spurious comment about the faith that you hold to be true. That person is going through life without the input of the Word without a knowledge that God loves them enough to have sent His Son to die for them. They are going through the coronavirus. They are going through these times in our country without the input of the Word. They're losing loved ones. The older we get, we're going to, I don't know how many of you have your parents around. We don't have any of ours, Chris or I. Um, we're losing loved ones. What was the meaning of that life? What was the purpose? What's my purpose in life? So you may have friends or family members or others who are trying to get through life without the impact of the Word or an understanding of God's love for them. Can you imagine what that would be like for you? How would you face what you're facing in the world today without a grasp of God's love for you? Want to go there? I mean, that's what St. Paul says. We are not like those who have no hope. When a loved one dies, when, when, when we lose our job, why do people go nuts? Why, why, why do they go, what's the word? Postal. They get fired for not doing a good job, come back with a gun. They want to end. This is so mean to me. I want to, I want to do that to other people. How would we respond as a disciple of Christ if we believed in that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? If we kept that in mind as the boss comes with a pink slip? We don't go, oh no, this is the end of my life. No, there's no possibility. You can't do this to me. But instead say, I wonder what the Lord has in mind for me next. Where am I going? What am I going to be doing? It's an opportunity to reflect on the one who got you there. We know as disciples of Christ, it is God's love that brought us to this day. Every once in a while, it might be fun for you to kind of reflect back. Now, I, I don't know, I'd be interested if you send me an email, uh, if, if you have had a close encounter. I mean, I, I have them too often to mention. You know, I went through the ice, my backpack caught on the ice or I would have gone down to New York City without breathing. Uh, uh, I uh, had the Black Death when I was in seminary. Um, I, I, I fell asleep driving 65 miles an hour going into Pittsburgh. I can make a list a, a mile long. My life every day is by the grace of God. So we know that the Lord takes care of us, and we got to this day by His grace and power, not our own. So if we got fired, if, we, if stuff changes, it'll be okay. Because God says, I've got it under control. I am your refuge and strength. He is the one taking care of us. So he says, go and make disciples. Remember the old Ronald Reagan was quoting somebody else, uh, but uh, he's famous for having said it. When do you do that? Well, about the same time you go on a diet, right? Tomorrow? Next week? i got to study it a little bit more. You know, it's too late today because I had an extra cupcake for breakfast. You know, not supposed to have cupcakes for breakfast. When will we go and make a disciple? Ronald Reagan, if not now, when? If not us, who? So, uh, I don't know your friends. I don't know your family members. I'd be glad to meet them, get to know them. But right now, you know them. So you can pray, Lord, show me who it is that I will be an instrument of your love for them. Who is it that I can speak, I can pray for, and work on, and, and discuss with, and look for the opportunities. The Spirit wants them to know of God's love and will promise to give you the words. So I don't know, how many disciples could we make in a lifetime? 
Ought there be at least one by now? One a month? One a year? That gift of the Spirit enables us to make disciples of all nations. So, make disciples of all nations. Not, not just people we might choose. Uh, 30 years ago, we were a little mission church. And one of the ways we let people know they were welcome was to mail out um, a note, uh, put it in an envelope, send it out to those people who just moved into the neighborhood. How did we know who that was? It was a thing called electric cut-ins. When JEA turned power on for a new family, that was recorded. And by Freedom of Information Act, we could get that information. So we mailed them a letter and we said, hey, you know, we're a church here. We're, we're doing this ministry. Here's some information. We'd like to invite you to come. So every month we had members, volunteers, stuffing envelopes, mailing it out. One of them, because again, it was a little mission church at the time. Uh, one of them said, Pastor, I can help you here. Uh, she was stuffing envelopes. So oh, yeah, how would you like to help? She said, well, take for example this person. They're not going to accept this invitation. We, we, could just, we could put another sticker over that name. Because I know about ethnic groups. I know about groups that are not Christian by background. So we don't want you know, to waste money. I said, that's exactly the nation that we're called to invite. They live down the street. Maybe they won't come right today or this Sunday, but we are planting the seeds. God will give the growth. So the invitations do go to everybody. Sadly, years later, as the congregation grew, and now we've got a budget and we've got members and we've got some additional buildings, the evangelism person, God rest his soul, uh, came to me and said, Pastor, how long are we going to keep this up? I mean, we got a balanced budget. Why, why are we still sending out invitations? As if the invitation was related to our having a balanced budget and not them understanding the love of God in Jesus Christ. So we always want to be focused on why we're doing this and for whom it is for all nations. No distinctions, no separation for them all. We make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father. Psalm 8 is a great psalm. Uh, you know, when you look at the heavens, when you look at the creation, how do you not marvel? How in the world? God, why are you paying attention? Why are you remembering? Why are you mindful of me? With so much going on, you got to be busy. But that's that heart of God who cares not just for the universe, not just for all people, but for each of us individually. We are baptized in the name of the Father who created us and the Son who redeemed us. Our baptism is into Christ, into His death, so that as He was raised and lived a new life, we get to live a new life in Christ. The body we got is wearing out. That, that is going to happen. We're going to rest from our bodily labors. But that new life that we have by the gift of the Spirit is a life eternal. Nothing is going to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. How do we know that love? Because we were baptized into Christ Jesus and in the name of the Holy Spirit. Now this is where I would mention that this is before Pentecost. Now, this would be really good. It's a good thing you're behind the, the windshields that I can hardly see who's in what car because I would be asking you a tough question. What is the giveaway in the Gospel lesson that this is happening before the coming of the Spirit? How did it begin? How many were there on that mountaintop as Jesus was getting ready to leave? Giving the Great Commission. How many were there? How many apostles were there? Twelve. How many are there in this story? Eleven. A reminder. These failing disciples even had one who had been with Jesus for three years and yet commits suicide. Takes his own life. That's, that's not like picking a bad guy. That, that is self-separation. Judas dies. So there are 11 of them. How did they know what mountain to go to? 
How'd they know what mountain? It's an open book. You can, you can read it. Who told them? Jesus did not tell them. It is the women. The women are told. The women go to the tomb and, and the angel says, go to the mountain that Jesus told you. Remind them, go there. They go to the mountain in Galilee. Galilee of the Gentiles. So imagine a little bit of faith on the part of the disciples that they traveled from Jerusalem out to Galilee on the mountaintop told by women. Why told by women? Because the men were sure that Jesus was dead. They're not looking for a resurrected Lord. So there are all kinds of challenges uh, for these disciples and they are weakened. And it says... They met there on the mountain time, and some worshipped him. An extraordinary thing to worship a human being? No. To worship an angel? No. To worship God. They have grasped it. But what does it say? Some doubted. That's why they're waiting for power from on high, from the Holy Spirit. So, Jesus says, go and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I commanded you. Is that an odd phrase? Why why not just say, teaching them the commandments that I gave you? Why the observation? There actually is. The root of that has to do with seeing the command. How can they see the command? How do they see the commands that Jesus gave His disciples? They see you. They see us. When we are faithful, when we are living out our faith, ministry is faith in action. That we don't just mail out the commandments to people to try to get them to come to church. We show them the faith by living it out. So that announcement page, some of you got bulletins that are for uh, you know, one of the other services because the tent went down and it got all destroyed. But we wanted to make sure you had the announcements, even if it's a different service, so that you would know where you are called to be, how you will make a witness. One of our visitors asked me, said, would you be able to help, would the group be able to help finish a ramp that my brother-in-law started but now has cancer waiting for a liver transplant his wife was involved in a head-on collision in a car is in a wheelchair what do you think i was able to say of course we will finish that ramp of course we will nail it we will paint it so here's a visitor who is not a member of this church yet who looked at us and said this is the body of christ He looks at his family and says, there's a need. The body of Christ would come. Wasn't a stretch for him to believe I'd say yes, of course. I'd say, well, no, you know, they've never been to the church. I've never met them. Would that matter? Of course not. So we want to teach others to observe, to see, and then to copy what we're doing. We invite them to come and work with us. We've said it before, uh, to count up the number of doors at our church. Well, you got two doors here, kitchen door, uh, front door, side door to the sanctuary, side door to the sanctuary, side door to the gathering area, uh, out the teacher's door. That's a lot of doors. That's not all the doors in that building. Not all the doors to our church. When we invite someone to join in mission and ministry, that's a door. They are coming to church. They're seeing the church in action. So, I hope. I, my guy, I'll just tell you, you don't probably know him, but uh, I'm working on him. I'm praying about the guy who walks up and down the street who told me the reason he does it is not because he has health problems, but it's because he's bored. Because he has nothing to do in life. How sad that would be. I mean, I got more than enough. I'll share some with them. But, uh, but the idea of having nothing on your plate, none of the gifts God gave you get used for anything. So, 
all of us are gathered together as the body of Christ so that people can observe the commands of Jesus being lived out. So, what do you think the disciples felt when Jesus took off? Were they still listening? Isn't this an oxymoron? How do you say to us, I will be with you to the end of the age and then leave? Ha! Would they be surprised? I mean, if the Lord Jesus ever raised them from the dead, not after four days, but after 2,000 years, and they looked around the world and saw two billion disciples, would they be astounded? Would they believe that Jesus was with all of us to the end of the age? Yes. And so we thank God for the blessings He showered upon us in His Son, for the gift of the Father who created us, the Son who died for us, and the Holy Spirit that has brought faith within us. May God bless each of us in our witness. May others see the light of Christ in us. I pray that for us all in Jesus' name. Amen. Take a moment to meditate on the Word and the will of God.